Saran, and I'm so grateful to be back with you. I am just so grateful that the Lord moved in my heart a number of months ago to go into the book of 1 Peter, and we just completed it last week. There's a lot of things that are parallels in the world we're living in today that fit the book of 1 Peter, and it's so we're so grateful that the Lord had the apostle answer some of our questions, tell us what we really need to work on, and remind us of a vital truth, that what the Lord has placed within us at the time of our salvation matters far more than whatever may happen to us, whatever may come our way. Now that's a strong truth, but it's a truth only a person can say if they've had a time and had a place to ask Jesus Christ to be not only their personal Savior, but also their Lord. And as we're in between books, a lot of times I ask the Lord, what should we talk about as we're in between books? Because I want to go straight into another book before too long, and I want to study it verse by verse. I really want us to know the Bible and be very comfortable being able to use the Bible and apply the Bible. It's all about God's Word when we come together. There's no doubt about that. But in between, a lot of times I like to do pastoral work, and what the Lord has pressed on my heart to say is, yes, there is a Savior, and yes, His name is Jesus, but here's the question of the hour. Is he your savior? Some people say to me, I've been a Christian all my life. Well, a person can't be a Christian all their life. You can't be born into being a Christian. You can't just say that you're a Christian because you've gone to church or because you pray or because you opened the Bible or you came from a Christian family. We need to become a Christian the way that the Bible teaches. And we'll be talking about that today. And so if you've never had a time and place where you've asked Jesus to come into your heart, if you've never really had peace that you understood what you were doing, let's nail that one down. Let's recognize the fact that Jesus is not only the Savior, but he can become our Savior. And that changes everything, not only in this world, but in the world to come. If you have your Bibles, I'd sure like you to go with me to the book of John. We'll be looking at a very familiar passage of Scripture, John chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. But let's begin by going to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, that there are many names that you go by. But Father, the most precious of all is the fact that you're the Savior. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you desire to be the Savior of all people, but you don't force yourself on anyone. You let us know in your word what it means to become a Christian, a follower of Christ. May we really understand what that means today. And Lord, if there be even one in our midst who has wondered about that, has been frightened about that, uncertain about that, or just going through all different kinds of things in their mind, Father, we pray that that would be something that would be nailed down, that they would make that decision, and they would experience forgiveness of sin, newness of life, and one day, one glad and glorious day, the sure and certain knowledge that they'll be with you throughout all of eternity. Father, we pray today, Lord, in a world that's ever-changing, in a world where there's so much chaos and so much pain. Father, we pray, Lord, we'd hear your voice above every other voice. And Father, we pray that we would celebrate again what you have done for us of your own volition, of your own will. And Father, we pray, Lord, that we would celebrate our salvation even if we asked you years and years ago into our heart. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us, and we pray that you speak to us now, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I love Jesus, and I'm very unapologetic about that. Anyone who knows me, I hope that they know that I love Jesus Christ. And when I read about Jesus in the Bible, I recognize that the Bible uses an awful lot of terms when it speaks of Christ. The Bible describes Jesus by saying that he's the Son of God. God. He's just as much God as God the Father and God the Spirit, but it describes him as the Son of God. The Bible says that he's the wonderful counselor. The Bible says that he's the redeemer. The Bible says that he's the prince of peace, and he's the dearest friend. But there's another word that the Bible uses when it describes Jesus Christ, and to me it's the most precious word of all. It's the word Savior. Jesus is the Savior. And that's what I feel led, again, to share with you today. Jesus is the Savior. But here's the question of the hour. It's the question that matters now more than anything, and it's the question that will matter more in eternity than anything else. Is he your Savior? Have you had a time and place where you've asked Jesus to forgive you of your sin? If you had a time and place where you've turned from your sin, repented of your sin, if you had a time where you asked Jesus not just to be your Savior, but to be your personal Lord? 
Lord. You see, it's not enough to simply believe that Jesus exists. That's a good thing to recognize that he exists. It's an influential thing to know and an inspiring thing to know that Jesus exists, but it's not enough to just say that I believe that Jesus exists. It's not enough to say, well, you know what? I believe that Jesus really did come from heaven down to earth, that he subjected himself to all kinds of trials and temptations just like us, and then he died on a cross and he rose from the dead. Those things are true, and it's good to be able to affirm those things, but that's not enough just to be able to affirm those things to know that you've received salvation. Again, what do we have to have? We have to have a specific time, a specific place, where we come before the Lord and we acknowledge, I have sinned. I have missed the mark. I have said some wrong things. I have done some wrong things. I have thought some wrong things. And I've done a lot of right things, but I've done a lot of the right things for the wrong reason. I have sinned in my life, and I need you to forgive me of my sin and come into my heart as my personal Lord and Savior. As I was thinking about the word saved, I recognized that it's a, such a beautiful word. And as I was thinking about the word saved, I thought about the fact that over the course of my life, I'd had some brushes with death a number of times. When I was just 11 years old, there was a day when I just had a high fever that went on and went on and went on for week after week. Finally, when I went to the doctor, they were concerned about the fact that I had high fever for such a long time, but they were equally concerned with the fact that almost every day I slept through the entire day, day after day after day. Finally, one of the doctors suggested that I get a spinal tap, and when they gave me a spinal tap, they recognized I had not only spinal meningitis, but I had encephalitis, and they put me into the hospital on my birthday, my 11th birthday, and I stayed in there for two weeks, and over the course of that time, there were many times that they told my parents they weren't sure if I would survive. I've had some brushes with death, and I'm sure you have too. Later in my life, when I was living in, in high, living after high school in Maryland, I remember one time going on the highway, and I was going on the highway, all of a sudden a truck that was in the middle came over in my lane and didn't even see that I was coming. And I looked and I didn't see any way that I could go in front of him or any way that I could go slow enough and him come behind me because he was just coming straight across the highway. And so not knowing what else to do, I turned into a median in the middle of the highway and made it across. It was a harrowing experience. No one was hurt. I don't even know if the truck driver ever knew, but it certainly was a brush with death. Another time when I was in college, I was in a car accident, and I'm grateful to say that although um, the, the other car was totaled and mine was sort of banged up, no one was hurt from that, and I am so very grateful for that. And then years ago, I remember when I was in New Mexico one day, driving and stopping at a stoplight on the right-hand side of the road, and I looked over, and there's a very large 16-wheeler truck, and it was at the same light that I was, and before it turned green, it started to turn and started to move out, and he was taking up all the lanes, and all of a sudden I recognized that, boy, he's taking up the lane that I'm in too, and if I don't get out of the way, he's just gonna go right over top of my car. And so I honked my horn and honked my horn, and I watched as people who were out in the street started to yell and yell and yell, and then all of a sudden, the driver absolutely stopped. My car was messed up, but I was okay. Now, I know what you may be thinking. You may be thinking, Pastor Ron, I don't know if I ever want to ride with you in a car, especially if a big truck is nearby. Yet I believe that what's true for me has been equally true for almost everyone here. Most people have probably had at least one brush with death in their lifetime. Most people have probably been in some situations and some circumstances where they knew that they needed saving. Sometimes we have an upfront close encounter with death and somehow, some way, we simply get out of it. Sometimes we look back beyond the surface and we say to ourselves, there's no rhyme and there's no reason as to why we were spared. We should not be here, but we know that we are. Other times we know we're in trouble. Other times we know that our situation was progressively getting worse and worse and there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. In those times, we desperately looked around we looked around for help, and in those times, we would certainly have been willing to holler if that was necessary to save us. Saved. Saved. What a beautiful word. What a comforting word. I love to hear that word. I love to say that word. I love to sing about salvation. And most of all, I love what it means. 
I want to tell you about another time that I needed saving. Death was absolutely a sure thing. The circumstances in my life had nothing to do with disease and had nothing to do with driving. I was in trouble and I knew it. I needed saving and I knew it. I had made the choice to deliberately sin. The warnings had been crystal clear. The danger signs were clearly visible. From the time I was a small child, I heard the message of God's word and I understood biblical truth. I understood that sin separates us. I understood that there was no way a person could go, in, go to heaven, a perfect place, if they remained in the shape that they were in. I don't remember my first sin, but I do know this much. It did not take me long to become a seasoned sinner. I was separated from God, and I knew it. I was unsure. I was discouraged. I was fearful when it came to dying. And if the truth be known, I was more than a little bit nervous about what life had for me in the years ahead. I desperately wanted peace. I wanted hope. I wanted joy. I wanted meaning. I wanted purpose. I wanted assurance. However, I knew that I could not break the grip that sin had on me without help. I knew I needed divine intervention. I knew I needed a savior. Spiritually speaking, I called 911 and I asked God on the on the royal telephone, if you will, to answer, and I'm so glad he did. I am so glad, so very grateful that Jesus saves. And I'm so grateful that Jesus is not just the Savior of the world, but Jesus has saved me. I am so grateful that the Lord loves us and values us enough to come to this sin-scarred earth to pay for your sins and to pay for mine. I am so grateful that when we ask him to forgive us of our sins and we repent of our sins, he comes into our heart to be not only our Savior, but our Lord. Jesus came to set us free from the grip of sin, and when he sets us free, what did the Lord say? He said, you are free indeed. Jesus came to pay a price that you and I could not pay. Jesus came to open up the path so we can walk in newness of life. His desire is for us to have the best kind of life here on this earth, and one day, one glad and glorious day, if we know Jesus, we will either go to him or he will come to us so we can be together with him forever in a wonderful place called heaven. It's the most blessed day of a person's life when they come to terms with the fact that they need a Savior. It's such a blessed day when a person says, not only do I need a Savior, but I need the only Savior, Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us about a man who is at that particular point. Deep in his heart, in his mind and in his soul, he wondered. He wondered, are there answers, real answers? Is there hope, real hope? He wondered, is there anything that I have to do to be able to have purpose and meaning and joy in my life? And one day after pondering for long enough, he decided that he could wait no longer and he went to check with the expert. He went to see and talk with the one who knew all the answers. What did he do? He came to Jesus. The man's name was Nicodemus. I want you to see what happened to him again. Look with me in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. The Bible tells us, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, he spoke strongly, he spoke openly, I tell you the truth, no one will see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. How can a man be born again when he is old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot go for a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus, he answered him immediately, he says, I tell you the truth, no one, there's no exceptions to this rule, can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and a spirit. Now notice in there in the Bible that that word spirit is capitalized. He's speaking of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit, the Holy Spirit, gives birth to the spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, Nicodemus, remember, he's an older man. He's a very religious man. And so he says, how can this be? 
And, and he, when he asked that question, Jesus said, you are Israel's teacher and you do not understand these things. I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know and we testify of what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes, that doesn't just mean affirm, it means you entrust your life, you place, you place your life in his hands, you, you give your life over in him, believes in him, may have eternal life. And then two of the more precious verses in all the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, whoever believes in him, shall not perish but have everlasting life for god did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him now on the surface it seems rather unusual that nicodemus would come to jesus to check out the claims of christianity yet obviously something was missing within him and he knew it he must have been having some inner turmoil. He must have needed answers. Nicodemus was a religious teacher, a teacher of the law, and he came to Jesus at night. He wanted to speak to him privately. He wanted to speak to him substantively. He came to Jesus at night, and he must have come to Jesus because he had a hole in his heart and a hole in his soul. John, the apostle, tells us that Nicodemus was a highly educated man. He was a highly respected man, yet deep in his heart, he knew that only Jesus had real answers. It's interesting to see that Nicodemus, who was a leader, came to the ultimate leader, Jesus, asking a question. Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin. That was like being a member of the Supreme Court today. So Nicodemus was an educated person. He was a wealthy person. He was a respected person. He was a person of position. He was a person of power. Yet that one night he made the choice because of the pull that was within him to stand before Jesus seeking not only guidance but truth. Now ask yourself why. Why would an educated person, a wealthy person, a person of position and power come before a poor man so poor that he only owned one thing and that was his robe? Why would a man such as Nicodemus come before someone like Christ? Why would an aristocrat like Nicodemus come to a wandering preacher named Jesus? Well, let me tell you why. Nicodemus discovered something we all do well to discover, education. It's a valuable thing. It's not valuable enough. Money. That can be helpful, but it's not helpful enough. Position, that can be a pleasure, but it's not pleasure enough. Prestige, as shiny as these things may be, they cannot bring satisfaction for a very long time. I remember someone one time in history asked John Rockefeller, how much money is enough? How much do you need? And Rockefeller whirled around and he said, just one dollar more than what I have right now. What did Nicodemus knew? Well, he knew that wisdom and wealth could not purchase power and peace. So he came to the Prince of Peace looking for peace. Even though he was religious, he had no relationship with Jesus Christ, and he desperately wanted to be saved, whether he knew that term or not. He desperately needed a Savior. He recognized that religion in and of itself cannot provide love and joy and peace and comfort and strength and assurance. Nicodemus would certainly say amen to that, and there was a pool in his heart, an empty place, so empty that he made his way to Jesus. John tells us that Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Now, if you grew up hearing about the Pharisees when you were in church, you probably heard the same things that I did. When you think about a Pharisee, you think about somebody who's rigid. You think about somebody who's legalistic. You think about somebody who's very proud. Yet it's also fair to say that although they may have had these traits, humanly speaking, they tried really hard to please God using what they could bring about from their own energy. Pharisees made it a habit to try not to ever lie, steal, cheat, and every week they fasted at least two different times. They prayed daily at least three times, and they financially supported the temple in a very powerful way. If anyone could have been right in the eyes of God through human endeavor, it would have been Nicodemus. Yet in his heart and in his life he had a hole. Something was missing and he knew it. 
He needed an answer, and so he came before Jesus. And I want you to see again how Jesus spoke to him and what we can learn from it. So look back with me, if you will, at verse 3. Jesus is speaking, and he says to Nicodemus these words, I tell you the truth. Jesus always means what he says and always says what he means. He says, I'm telling you the truth. There's only one kind of truth. Truth is narrow by his own definition. I tell you the truth. No one, there's no exceptions to this, can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. What a shame that the, that the words born again have taken on such a negative connotation for some. To be born again is the most beautiful thing that could ever happen to a person. In other words, Jesus is saying, unless a person has a personal encounter with him, he or she will not see God, and the hole that they have in their heart will never be filled. Nicodemus was a good man. He was a religious man, but he needed to be what? He needed to be born again. Nicodemus wasn't sure exactly what Jesus meant when he spoke about being born again. So in verse 4, he says, How can a man be born again when he's old? Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. And Jesus knew the sincerity of this man's heart, so he responded to him. Look with me at his words in verses 5 through 7. He said, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and of spirit. That's that Holy Spirit we're talking about right now. Notice in the capital S, flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Now when the when the Lord spoke of water, he was referring to physical birth. When a child's born, we all know this, the water that protects them in the womb is no longer necessary. And so when a child is born, that water it pours out. Clearly, one cannot be born again until they're born. But just as clearly, one cannot be born again unless they have a personal relationship, life-changing relationship with God. That's the only way that they can be born again. They mean to be born not just of water, but they need to be born of the Spirit. The Bible very clearly tells us that salvation comes this way. We have to confess our sins. In the Greek, that's the word homeolego. It means to say the same things about our sin that God does. We need to ask him to forgive us of our sin. We need to repent or turn from our sin. And then we need to ask him to be not only our Savior, but our personal Lord. That's how salvation takes place. But it doesn't stop there. After being saved, and a person becomes a Christian, and the Lord then gives us a wonderful way to be able to express our devotion to Him by being baptized. We just baptized just a couple weeks ago. Eight people, what a night of rejoicing, what a night of utter joy, what a wonderful thing to witness, what a wonderful thing to experience. I will forever hold that night in my heart. Being baptized is so much better than just raising your hand. Being baptized is so much better than just filling out a form or even just walking down an, an aisle. Being baptized portrays what's already taken place in your heart. You have a new lease on life. You've been forgiven. You've been restored. You have been buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Sometimes people ask me, what do you think is the toughest opponent that people ever face? Well, the toughest opponent we face, probably for sure, is the evil one in our own human nature. And one of the ways that the evil one in our own human nature tends to come against us is with guilt. The evil one in our own human nature often uses guilt to knock on the door of our lives, pounding over and over again on the doors of yesterday's trouble, reminding us of pain and regrets we have from the past. I never will forget one day when Ann Landers was being re, um, interviewed by David Brinkley. He asked her a very pointed question. He said, is it possible that people all over the years have asked the same question in one form or fashion or another? And Ann Landers said, yes, that is possible. Everyone seems to be asking this. Why did I do that? Why did I choose to do wrong? What is missing in my life? And when you get past the superficial, People know that something is missing in their lives. 
What do they know? They know they've sinned. Again, what is sin? It's missing the mark. It's saying the wrong thing. It's thinking the wrong thing. It's doing the wrong thing. We're doing the right things, but doing them for the wrong reason. They know that they've sinned. And they know what else? They know that sin separates us not only from God. They know that sin separates us from each other. So how can that void be filled? And how can a life be cleansed? I love how Jesus answers those questions. He told the Apostle John to write these words down. And we hear these words. We know these words. We've heard them so many times. So let's hear them in the most familiar translation of all, the King James trans translation, John 3, 16 and 17, where we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. What a great promise that is. And when I was a boy, I remember reading John 3, 16, and I thought, I need to know 17, and I need to know 15, so I can really benefit. And so I memorized John 3, 17 as well, and it tells us, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. There are an awful lot of people who say that they have the saving idea. There are an awful lot of people who are telling us how we can be saved from this and saved from that. But there's only one Savior, and his name is Jesus. And when a person asks Jesus into their life, what happens? A change takes place. The scripture tells us that strain, that change is so powerful will become a new creation. No, you may not look different, but believe me, you'll be different. And there's no doubt about that at all. Because what's happened? You've got living faith. You have the Holy Spirit now, not just coming beside you, but within you, and he sealed you into the day of redemption, the day you go to heaven to be with God, or the day Jesus comes back for you. Think about it this way, if you will, for a while. Prince Charles talked about a time when he was young. He and his cousin watched a group of young children out having a snowball fight through the palace window, and they thought that would really be a fun thing to do. It looked like so much fun, he said, we just couldn't resist. So what did we do? We disguised ourselves and we joined in. And we were having a really great time until one of the children accidentally threw a snowball through a palace window. And at that moment, royal children or not, they did the thing every child would do. They scattered. He said, only three of us were nabbed. My cousin, a neighbor boy, and myself. He says, as the guards grip became greater, I yelled, let me go, let me go. I'm the Duke of Windsor. Without hesitation, his cousin blurted out, let me go, let me go, I'm the Duke of Wales. And then the other boy, the neighbor, hearing the words, shouted out, let me go, let me go, I'm the Queen of England. Yeah, right, I'm the Queen of England. No, we may not look any different, but if you know Jesus in a personal way, believe me, you are different, and you become a member of his royal family. What does the Bible say? It tells us that when we make that choice, we've stepped from death to life. Not just life eternal, but life abundant. The Bible says that God has come into our heart, and when God comes into our heart, Jesus has promised us he will never leave us, he will never forsake us, and no one and nothing can pluck us out of his hand. The Bible tells us that he will conform us in the image of Jesus, and someday, some glad and glorious day, we will go to live with God forever. This isn't due to anything that we could do, but to the love, the power, the holiness, and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Nicodemus had every single thing that this world offers, but he wasn't satisfied. He needed to be born again, so he came to Jesus, the only one who could offer salvation. And you know what's great? Jesus offered him salvation, and he still offers that gift today. So let me ask you the most important question you'll ever be asked. Have you received the gift of salvation? Again, I'm not asking you to believe that Jesus actually lived, that there really was a historical person named Jesus. Do you believe that Jesus came to earth? That's not the question I'm asking either, although I hope and pray that you do. I'm asking, have you had a time, have you had a place where you've repented of your sins, where you've asked the Lord to forgive you of your sins and come into your heart to be your personal Lord and personal Savior? If you've never done that, you can do that today. And if you're unsure, you can nail that one down. You see, there's no one like Jesus. 
Yes, he's the Redeemer. He's the Counselor. He's the dearest friend. But he's the one and only Savior. I love that old Gaither song, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name, Master, Jesus, Savior. Like um, heaven's blessings come about just at the very sound of Jesus' name. I love that old hymn, Then Jesus Came. It talks about all these different people who went through so many different things. And then Jesus came and changed absolutely everything. Not too long ago, I was working on my little blue book. Those who know me well, that I know, I know I have a little blue book. Write down my convictions and write down what I'd like to see happen and my family remember down the years after I pass away. And I thought about some of the music I would want to have played, not that I'd be listening to it, but so it would serve as a testimony for me after I've left this world. And I've often thought about Hand in Hand with Jesus. If you're not familiar with that, it's an old gospel song. It's a, it's a great song. I thought about moving up to glory land. That's a little bit of my southern gospel roots. But I also thought about a song that is just a powerful song, and it, and it goes like this. I won't sing it, but I will share it with you. There is a Savior. What joys express. His eyes are mercy. His word is rest. For each tomorrow, for yesterday, there is a Savior who lights our way. And then after saying those words, it transitions. Listen to how it goes from there. Are there burdens in your heart? Who doesn't have some burdens in their heart? Is your past the memory that binds you? Who doesn't have that going on? Is there some pain that you've carried far too long? Then strengthen your heart. In his good news, there is a Savior, and he's forgiven you. There is a Savior. What joys express? His eyes are mercy. His word is rest. For each tomorrow, for yesterday, there is a Savior who lights our way. I love that word. And I love that song because it says it all. There is a Savior and there's only one. And let me tell you his name. His name is Jesus Christ. But again, here's the question of the hour. It's the most important question we ever answer in this lifetime or in the lifetime to come. Is he your Savior? Only you know the answer to that question. If he's not, you can come to him today. You can come to him this morning. You can call me or any number of people and we'll be glad to pray with you and share with you and walk you through all the verses we've talked about today and so much more. And if you're here and you're unsure, you can nail that one down and you can be sure today. There is a Savior. His name is Jesus. And he wants to be your Savior. There is a Savior. But is he your Savior? That's the most important question of all. Let's pray. Father, we know, Lord, that a lot of times we mix up being born into a Christian family and thinking that that automatically makes us a Christian. Maybe when we were a baby, we were baptized, and we think that we're a Christian, but the Bible doesn't talk about that. Father, maybe we open up the Bible and we read it from time to time, or we pray, or we affirm biblical truth and, and talk about the Bible with words of honor and respect. All these things are, are, are profitable and all these things have elements of great goodness in them. But Father, we know that they do not bring about salvation because there's no work that we can do that can earn for us salvation. We know that salvation is a gift of God. And so Father, we pray today, Lord, that as we think about what we learned in Peter, as we live in this world that's just so rapidly changing, as we recognize that every day we get closer to the time that Christ will come back to speak to our hearts. And Father, if there be even one who has never had that time and never had that place where they've asked Jesus Christ to be their personal Lord and Savior, that they'd make that decision. And Father, if there be some who have wondered and worried, but they've just held that one underneath their breath, that they would breathe out and get that one settled for sure. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you came here to be the Savior. And we thank you that you've extended that so that you can be our Savior. Lord, no greater gift could ever be given. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that that's a gift that has our name on it. If we've had that time and if we've had that place where we've asked Jesus to forgive us of our sins, come into our heart to be our personal Lord and Savior. 
Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.